Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Before going to my presentation, I would like to express my gratitude, Professor Dr. Agarwal, in fact, uh, who wrote me in two, 2013 to participate in such kind of roundtable. I could not make it uh, due to unavoidable, unavoidable situations, um, including visa problems. So I'm happy to. And also, um, Professor um, Chandraban Banu Patnaik and also uh, Father uh, Joseph, uh, Franz Joseph. So, greetings to everybody. So this, my presentation is, in fact, this, this is a paper uh, written by me and my brother who is doing his PhD in Australia. And he's, he's a journalist and also a human rights activist. The, uh, the title of my paper, that is the Religious Sensitivity and Freedom of Peace and the Recent Trends of Killing Gnostic Atheists in Bangladesh and Overview. You know, in Bangladesh, that is, uh, the situation is that after 2013, the progressive uh, writers, journalists, blockers, uh, they have been killed um, one after another by the extremist Islamists, especially the man behind the scaling, Jamaat Islami Bangladesh and its other organizations. Uh, you please go. Yeah. Uh, then, um, so this uh, this uh, paper is trying to understand that um, why the attack on the free thinkers and what are the alternatives and how it can be solved and what are the um, what should government do to address the problem. Till today. Uh, uh, number uh, eight blog, uh, bloggers and uh, progressive writers were killed by the so-called Jamaat Islami and Elements. And the fact is that uh, the, the the writers and bloggers who were killed uh, in the same way, they have been noticed um, via text, uh, mobile phone messages, or uh, via Facebook or Twitter, or phone, they, they are going to be killed, and so their days and numbers. So the fact is that they are blaming these people as atheist or mutat, uh, which means that they are against Islam. So they are defaming Islam as well as dishonor is prophet or Allah. The thing is that the problem lies is there, but nobody define who are atheists, who are mutad. Not even the who are killing these people, the progressive people, they don't have any definition, concrete definition by atheist or by mutad, who are they? who we can call mutad or atheist. On the same part, the government, they are also sometimes, the government remains silent. There is no concrete definition by mutad or by atheist whom we can understand. At the same time, from the academic arena, the intellectuals or the progressive people who are fighting against this heinous act, they don't have a clear and uh, uh, concept by whom we would mean atheist and mutad. Even a renowned professor of history of Dhaka University, Professor Muntasi Mamun, who did a lot of work on our liberation lawyer and so and so, he performed his hajj and he's a practicing Muslim and he prays five times a day. Even he was declared as atheist and mutad. So you see the situation, what is going on in Bangladesh. So the thing is that it has been found Anybody who speak against the Jamaat elements or their students' wings, uh, they, they are declared by Muttat simply because it goes against their interest. These people, they are progressive. There are so many practicing Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Christians. In fact, the intelligentsia, most of them in Bangladesh, they, they are secular. 
even in our constitutions there is uh, four elements that is uh, secularism is one of them secularism nationalism democracy democracy and some problem i can uh, forget this secularism democracy nationalism and respect for others so this is a term which has not been uh, clearly stated in any documents utilizing on this anybody can uh, can uh, claim that uh, he or she is mutad he is she is or she is atheist so this is the confusion what to do and utilizing this situation especially jamaat jamaat islam of bangladesh most of their leaders uh, you know they are oil criminals and that, that they are under arrest they are in jail and uh, they have been sentences um, life imprisonment and some of them uh, they are sentenced to death so so when most of their leaders um, they have been hanged by the tribunal international uh, crime tribunal which was set up by the present government of sheikh hasina so they want to create a confusion that if anybody speaks against them they term it they are speaking against islam or they are speaking against the prophet or they are uh, uh, demeaning the islam that is not the true even the practicing muslim scholar one is maulana masood and he is a uh, ulema and i think last month he he went to japan to participate in a conference they also declared him as murtad they also declared him as nastik so this is this is the situation in that case i try to me and my brother i try to find out the literature review why it is happening and why uh, attack on the free thinkers and a historical review in fact the first in 1971 uh, uh, in 1972 after the independence of bangladesh one poet famous poet uh, daud haider he is a very famous poet and he wrote a poem and in that poem he uh, uh, said something he blamed something including muhammad jesus christ buddha so he uh he in his poem so this this has this created the situation when the islamist they make a processions and they um want that daud hader should be stoned to death in that thing in the in that time daud hader left uh, uh bangladesh and he went to he took asylum in germany another thing happened in 1994 you know one of our women writer tasleema nasrin uh, she published her book lajja shame and in that very book she narrated a situation of a hindu family uh, what and there have been uh, the family they are oppressed by the muslims and blah 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 this is so in when this um, book was published then this islamist again uh, became active and they they announced that 5500 5000 us dollar for her head if anybody can kill the slimana sin so she or she he or she would be uh, given 5000 us dollar that was the situation at that moment and what uh didn't government the government of khaled ajia now the opposition leader um they didn't the government didn't try to um save taslim bana sain did their uh, some of his call, her colleagues and friends um take the initiative and after 44 days she left the country and now she is uh, living in india or usa sweden blah 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 even now she cannot enter to bangladesh if she comes to bangladesh they gain the situation will be hot so and then after 1994 another position it came up in 2013 hifazat islam you know hifazat islam 
In 2013, there is a platform that is Gano Jagaran Mancho, a platform for people's consciousness. It is um, solely uh, by the young generation of Bangladesh. Most of the people there are uh, their teens, 20s, and 30s. They wanted uh, capital punishment to the wire criminals. One of the wire criminals, that is Kadir Mullah, in fact, he was known as the butchers of Mirpur. Mirpur is an area in the Dhaka city. And at that, in 1971, this Kadir Mullah, uh, he killed the entire male population of that village, 230 people. He himself raped more than a dozen women. And he also raped and killed a pregnant woman. When the woman was uh, trying to save herself, entering into her house, room, then she followed her, then closed the door, and raped her and killed her. And her little daughter, she was under the bed, and she saw everything. And she uh, narrated the story in front of the court. So this is Kadri Mullah. And what the court, the, the International uh, Crime Tribunal, sentenced Kadri Mullah to life imprisonment. And this makes the young generation you know, annoyed, and they make a platform and throw Twitter, throw Facebook, uh, online. In 5th February 2013, it happened, and they make a platform. People are coming in the central point of Dhaka city, that is Shahabak, adjacent to the uh, Dhaka University campus, that is the central point of the city. So thousands of people uh, uh, gathered at the place within three and four hours. So it continues month after month, February, March. So they demanded that government should, there's a law that, um, that government cannot go for the appeal against, the, against the, this court judgment. They, then they forced the government to change the law so that the government can go for the appeal if the uh, wire criminal is not given life sentence and then government was bound to sit in the parliament and change the law, and against the, the, uh, this uh, government uh, appeal, the appellate division, and he was hanged to death, Kadri Mullah. So this is the demand of the next generation in Bangladesh in such a situation. So finding, this, uh, finding such a critical situation, Jamaat Islami and students' wings, the Islamic Satoshibir, Islamic Students' Funds, they are also active on online, so Facebook, so Twitter, and they are blaming this progressive young generation that they are against Islam, they are hating Islam. What they are doing, they are opening fake accounts in Twitter, in Facebook, and they are posting these things in the name of these things. They are atheists, they, are, they don't believe in Islam. And there are some bloggers, they, they do practice Islam. And some of them are in the management committee of some mocks in their villages. But so, finding this, Jamaat Islami became worried because most of their leaders, they are uh, under trial and they have a strong economy. Uh, and then this, from this platform, from Gano Jagan Mancho, it was, they invited the people, asked the people to boycott all their financial institutes, their schools, their colleges, their banks, their hospitals, everything their media, everything. And at that moment, they have one television that is Digonzo television that was spreading some false news that are the, 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 and the, they are also projecting that the young men and women, they do have sex at night in the, at Shahabak and condom has been found there and blah, blah, blah. They are ethics and they are drinking uh, wine, blah, blah, blah. So, and that the newspapers as well as the television doing this, the, this movement. So, and when Hifazat Islam called a uh, meeting on 5th May 2013, and, and Hifazat Islam called in 2013 against the so called Alice Gnostics, and they brought, uh, you know, more than 30,000 people all over the country. First day and second day, another 30,000. So, so many people are, th are there. They all also blocked one part of the city. And there, 
processions, their meetings, their gathering uh, was being broadcast by that television news. And, and the hatred of free space they are giving from their platform, from the month, you know. So finding no other alternative at that time, the government asked them to leave the place, but they didn't do it. So in the time, government uh, take the stern actions uh, with the help of the police, military. So they compelled the people to leave the place. But it was reported in their television as well as the newspaper, they, more than 5,000 people have been killed during the overnight. That was totally false and lie. So the next day, government took the initiative to close down the television, the newspaper, and the radio, radio station also. In such a situation, uh, the Jamaat and this Alice became very arrogant, and they make a list, 88 persons. They make a list, 88 persons uh, who were in the hit list, and uh, they will kill them. So, and eight of them uh, already killed by them. Some. So, this is the real situation in Bangladesh, in such a situation. So, blaming others is a um, uh, uh, means of Jamaat, and whoever uh, go against him, goes against the, their policy, they are all atheists in Bangladesh. And what they did, you know, <coughs> when one of the uh, criminal, white criminal, uh, uh, Maulana Saidi, his name is Saidi, when the court declared his verdict that Saidi is given life's imprisonment, then this Jamaat people, uh, most of the areas in Bangladesh, uh, went to the mocks, they captured the mocks, and announced uh, in the mic, you know, the people, please gather. Uh, uh, the judgment has been declared and Saidi has been given a la sentence, blah, blah, blah. So they, you know, they propagate false news and people are gathering and they take the possessions and come to the, some of the towns and they are, um, so people, uh, police try to control them, then they are fight, they, uh, they also, f um, there's a fight between police and these people. They also fight. Uh, gun, gun, they use gun, bombs, everything. And so to control them, police also use them. So some, of, so, some people are injured, in fact. But there is no killing. But it was reported uh, in the newspaper, in, in, a, in like Eolo journalism. You know, this is the situation. So what happened in, you know, the, the Imam of Kaaba is a very prestigious person in Islam. So every year, I think, the, the cover, the gilap of Kaaba Shoeib, that is changed by some things. So uh, after the change of the, the cloth of Kaaba, cover of Kaaba Shoeib, then there was a prayer, some things. Then they posted it that uh, the, the Imam of uh, Kaaba Shoeib uh, is very shocked because of Saidi's judgment. And he is uh, praying God and asking the government to forgive him. So this is the one sort of false propaganda against the progressive uh, writers, bloggers, and as well as journalists. So this is the things, and that is what has been found uh, that they they are running after the liberal forces. He, especially the journalists, especially the bloggers, and progressive thinkers. And the thing is that, you know, the government was not that much active. When anything happens, government asks the police to control it. In 2016, 1st July, there was a killing, you know, 18 foreigners were killed in Gulshan area because um, these people, the Jama trained up the kids or the young people uh, of the rich family who were going to the English medium schools and having the education in USA, Australia, Malaysia. So they formed a young group who carried out this sort of killing. So five young men, 
they, that is the rough month of Ramadan and the foreigners are there in the uh, Holy Artisan Bakery, it's a uh, Spanish uh, uh, restaurant. They went there, uh, the Italian, some Italians, some Japanese, uh, two Indians, and some Bangladeshis also. All of a sudden, they went to the bakeries and started firing the people. You know this. Thing. And it, it, con it, it, it continued the whole night. Even there, the um, Italian lady, she was pregnant, but they killed him. And the first they told me, okay, who are the Muslims? Who are the Bengalis people? Then they identified the Muslims, the Bengali people. Okay, we are not going to fit you. Then they, at night, they asked the uh, bakery man to prepare their, it called that, uh, dinner, uh, dinner. So they take the dinner, this pipe man, and after that, and they um, killed most all of the people over there, inside the there. So in the morning, the, there is operation uh, by the police, army personnel, and only uh, five or four people are freed, alive. So this is the situation. So now the, the problem is that... Yeah. To come to a summing up of, of your okay, excellent okay. paper, and with your permission, we will circulate your paper. Okay. So the incidents that you have narrated, yeah. the examples of violent fascism by the Jamaat Jamaat -e Islam, mm -hmm. and then come to your assessment of um, um, the salient um, assessment of your paper. It would be grateful if you can do that. And then I want to allocate some time for discussion. It's okay, a very okay. very important topic that you've raised here. The thing is that the positive forces are the concerned netizens, online activists who raised cyberware against the fundamentalist and anti-liberation forces and pointed that who pro and who are against Bangladesh. Their non-violent struggle is remarkable too. Even after the killing of the eight key bloggers by the followers of the opposition Islamic party, they did not abandon their non-violent spirits. The spirit that you gonna jagar monto, it was non-violent. At this moment, the only hope lies with them as they Act, are active and did not give up their critical writings. However, society, Islamic clerics, educational institutes, security ensuring and agencies and government need to work together to overcome such situation. Yeah. That is the, the movement was the non-violence and they are with non-violence and they are fighting against the violence. Violence. That is the uh, core point of this movement. So they are using the non-violence uh, way to face these uh, brutal killings and something else. And they are trying to make, the, make conscious the people so against this uh, uh, Islamist, ex Islamist. So their um, social media, uh, personal communications, uh, gathering, everything. That is this is going on as we speak. Yeah, yes, yes. This is a very contemporary yes, yes. Fluid and yeah. ongoing, yeah, uh, ongoing. Um, debate and uh, debate, yeah. so there are pockets of resistance but then there are also very strong <coughs> yeah. elements who've appropriated a lot of power, power and they own economic power yeah. and they own religious power yeah. and they're obviously misusing it. Yeah. Um, anything else you'd like to say in conclusion no. before I open it up? No. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, um, I will by the clock allocate about seven minutes for discussion and this has been a very, very important um, uh, paper that's, that's, that's come in. You uh, give a report on the situation and these things. Is there any more detailed study on the communication dimension of these things? So we know that you, you mentioned it, but it's the communication. So what are the role of communication in these things, positive, negative? Is there any study on that up till now? Probably not. I'm so doing a. I'm. I'm. I'm doing a one. Yeah. That, so then I would encourage you, you or somebody to look into the communication dimension of the. Of yeah, the, communication of dimensions. The happens, the, you know? the, the thing is that father, uh, there both of the th parties are using online, online and yeah, uh, but that's uh, social be media. Clarified and and analyzed. You yeah. Know, how do they do it? What is the success? Which instruments do they use? Something like that. So. Mm -hmm that we become more clear about the communication dimension because we are interested in religion and communication. Mm -hmm. no? mm -hmm. So there will be some, just as a kind of mm -hmm. comment on encouraging, encouragement, or whatever you want to call it. No? Thank you. Yeah.
T.T. Srikumar and we presented this paper on religious violence and communication at a conference which held in Indonesia last year. Mm. So the major point we raised there was, I mean traditionally as far as Islamic public sphere is concerned or the communication on who is speaking about Islam is concerned, traditionally for the last you know uh, one century it is primarily dominated by Islamist or known as Jamaat Islami. Mm. In most of the Muslim societies they control the media houses. That, that is why, I mean, even scholars like Mensky said that traditionally Islamists or Jamaat Islami has a control over the communication on Islam. But with the coming of new media, the new trend is that, I mean, especially the traditional Muslims are getting a voice to speak about Islam. And this is a new trend which is coming. And second important point is that even the studies on peace studies such as in this regard, as far as countering Islamic, uh, the violence in the name of Islam is concerned, mm. traditional Islam has to play a significant role. Mm. And the ulama in the traditional Islam has a significant role to play in this regard. Mm. As a result of that, their communication is very important. Yeah. And if you see figures like Amza Yusuf, Amza Yusuf is a figure uh, from America, uh, based in California, uh, is playing an active role in this regard. But unfortunate thing is that since these people are controlling, the, since Jamaat Islami and Islamists are controlling the communication on Islam, who is speaking about Islam, uh, they simply disregard whoever who speaks, quite, who is not conforming with their ideology as infidel or as out of the, uh, the Islam, Islamic framework. But it is not surprising. Because, you know, when the Maududi, who founded Jamaat Islami in 1942, the first thing they did, he did before the meeting was, he took a shahada. Shahada means, you know, the words you pronounce before entering into Islam. So in doing so, what he meant is that we were not Muslims before joining in this party. Mm. Or in other words, you know, Jamaat Islami implied that other Muslims are not yeah. Muslims yeah. if there is no political state. Yeah. So but that is not surprising to you. Yeah, but I want to just put it into perspective yeah. and make it clear. No? Okay. <laughs> So, okay, next one. Thank you. That was a very, 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 very pertinent, sharp comment. But, yes, Smita, please. I'm just curious, because I just saw your card, and it says that you are from the University of Dhaka. Now, obviously, you must be a minority there, you know, even to talk on these issues. Yeah, we are I'm negligible just, minority, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, but how does the... I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. I, I understand what you've been uh, talking. But I'm just curious, in, at the university, do they really uh, see this as an important issue? Do they really discuss, do they encourage free thinking? Of course, of course. Yeah, the, the, yeah of course. The problem. The yeah. yeah. But you, you have some support. Yes, yeah, support. Uh, because I, I don't know, I, I'm also curious to ask you, how safe are you? When no, no, my, in, the, <laughs> in the list I was there, 60, 16, my name is 16. You're you know? number 16 on yes, the list? 60, yeah, 60. And I was eight there. have been eliminated. Yeah, by yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm in the list, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <worried. laughs> We will list you here as well. Yeah, yeah. As a participant. Okay. But, but this continues to be a very fragile situation. Yeah, You're yeah. You're yeah. living with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Now the government is do, giving the police to protect these uh, bloggers and so most of the bloggers, the left, the country. They, so uh, even our vice chancellors, uh, they, he was in the, on the list and he has been given... You know, he used to come to the classroom by, on foot, but uh, on security purpose, no, no, the, he doesn't uh, work on the campus. So okay. uh, he, he's a very simple man, and he doesn't want to take the car, but on uh, you know, security, he has to go to the car, and police yes, is there. So, so <laughs> security. Yes, yeah, security. So. Um, yes. Yes, yes, of course. They are the Pakistani. They want to make it Banglastan, you know. Yeah, Banglastan. <laughs> Banglastan, everything. You know, when General Jia took power in 1975 after the killing of our father of the nation, in fact, they, he wanted to join the Pakistan. Then India signaled that if you join Pakistan, then we'll send our forces. Then they, okay, no, I, we don't. But they wanted to make this is Bangladesh, Banglastan. And even the, the, the people who went to Afghanistan and Pakistan to fight against Soviet Union or join the Taliban. Uh, a few years back, they told uh, that uh, Bangladesh will be a um, 
বাংলাস্থান উইল বি উইল বি তালেবান আমরা হব বাংলা বাংলা হবে বাংলাস্থান বাংলাদেশ হবে বাংলাস্থান আমরা হব তালেবান বাংলাদেশ উইল বি বাংলাস্থান অ্যান্ড উইল বি দ্য তালেবান সো ইন দিস ওয়ে দে আর্স দ্য ইয়ং পিপল টু জয়েন টু সাপোর্ট দেম so then there is funding also from these courses that support they, they have they have a strong economy one of the um, uh, professor of dhaka university economy in economics professor abul barkat he was uh, he's called as uh, the uh, people's economist uh, he has a huge work on the political economic of these uh, fundamental forces especially jamaat okay thank you so thank much razak thank, thank you for coming all the way from bangladesh really appreciate it um, let me invite one of our youngest presenters ahmed junaid he's coming in from ahmedabad and his paper is expression and formation of religious identity in the networked public exploring the case of the malayali muslim migrants in the uae so uh, i mean to just to grab your attention so i mean partly you know i mean here i would like to give you know broadly i would like to begin uh, my discussion on the first part i would be trying to uh, give a broader dis- discussion on the networked society and you know how muslim communities are engaging with that that would be the first part and sec- secondly you know i would be drawing from broadly on uh, my research work on the expression and formation of the religious identity based on my study among the diasporic muslims in uae uh, which was an integration of uh, both an online ethnography as well as uh, an extensive um, f- uh, kind of you know uh, an immersion uh, any an off- offline immersion uh, in the labor labor camps of uae for a period of one month and thirdly from that uh, broader dimension i would be coming to the specific topic of uh, my study uh, which is you know uh, which is i mean a term i have used here is the word cognitive ghettos so the word i have used the word ghetto in indian sense means uh, where a people of you know same community stays together that is the word ghetto mean broadly the word ghetto means i uh, could like that but i mean i am using this term in reference to the the kind of identity formation which is happening in online platforms my argument uh, with the support of empirical evidence uh, which i have collected through the online in mean, of the online discussions as well as my observation in the field is that uh, instead of you know instead of our assumption that online people widening the uh, widening the perspectives of people quite opposed to that it is bringing people with same orientation same ideology together then you know uh, making them you know quite more inclusive that, that that is the broader trend as my study suggests so i mean as far as the discourse of religion is concerned uh, this is a quote from the website of the center for media and religion university of colorado boulder where i was also a visiting scholar for a period of 3 months so it c- clearly says that even from the us perspective it clearly says that uh, from now onwards we have to see religion beyond as a private matter yeah in places like india i mean we have accepted the fact that definitely religion is not outside the public sphere it is part of the public sphere but even outside india even in western world uh, you know notice they are acknowledging the fact that religion has implications in the political life it has implications in the economic life so uh, i mean scholars are making efforts to find all these connections so uh, i mean as far as the specific question of what is the connection between religion and network technology is concerned uh, i mean scholars i mean this scholar many scholars have pointed out that or one of my observation is that much emphasis has been given to the political connections for example in the study of samuel landington he argues that nowadays you know i mean the the basic thing which forms nations would be in the future would be or civilized it would be civilizations people would be coming together as political blocks in cultural lines in religious lines so this is a, a this is of samuel landington which is rejected by many people so i mean quite following this you know there are scholars who looked into the topic and said that muslim i mean through online platforms uh, through network to publics muslims would come together and form as a political entity uh, they call this idea transnational transnational political identity 
So and they use, I mean, they use the cases like you know, people going to joining to join ISS as an example of the manifestation of you know transnational political identity. But uh, this is an argument which is contested by many, uh, you know, many scholars who argue that you know uh, this. I mean, this argument doesn't hold truth in the case of the majority of the Muslims. So, uh, then another thing is that uh, the role of the networked publics as a technology is often exaggerated in the studies on, you know, Muslims and networked publics. So, I mean, my position is that, uh, quite in lines with, uh, I mean, scholars like Campbell, though I have disagreements with her in many lines, is that, I mean, the network publics are playing a role along with multiple other factors. And if, if you take the case of Muslims in Bosnia, definitely the, the reasons why they use these platforms would be quite different uh, with the, the case of Muslims in Kerala, who is living in a multi multicultural society and uh, they, have a, they are leading a quite peaceful life. So it, it is like, you know, when you're trying to find a connection between uh, these platforms and, uh, I mean, the, uh, the believers, you have to pay much attention uh, to the, their conditions, the factors which determine their life. So my methodology is quite in uh, lines of that. So I mean, my, I mean uh, one of my future research direction is that scholars has to put uh, much attention and importance uh, to the, I mean, the specific societies, because each society can inform our understanding of the connections between uh, religion and, you know, network publics in uh, different ways. So, uh, I mean, one of the major gap is that uh, still uh, most of the studies are dominated by this discussion on the political question. So, I'm, I'm specifically studying diasporic Malayali Muslims. So, interesting thing about them is that nearly 2.5 million diasporic Malayali Muslims are working in uh, GCC countries. Uh, if you see the altogether population, uh, they are nearly the 25 per percentage of the total Muslims in Kerala, including women, women and kids. So, in a way, it is like, as far as working men is concerned, uh, a good number of them, a significant number of them, are living in Middle Eastern countries. So then another thing is that these people are active users of social media. I did my field work in their working places and I stayed with them. And what I have observed is that they're, they're using up to six to 10 hours. They spend six to 10 hours in different social media platforms. One reason is that most of them are staying away from their family. So they are living alone there. So as a result of that, they spend a good part of their time, significant portion of their time uh, with these platforms. So as far as Kerala is concerned, you can see, uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, church, temple, and mosque, it's separated by different walls in the same area. Uh, this, is a, this is a manifestation of multiple religious communities can coexist while having different faiths. And Kerala is a globally a proof to that. So this is, I mean, uh, this is the specific set of people whom I have studied. This is a picture I have taken, but you can see significant people are, you know, just into their uh, devices and they're spending their time that way. So yeah, it, it takes time. I'm just, you know, jumping from that. So I mean, here, here primarily I'm saying that uh, I mean, if you are studying societies, religious religious societies, uh, we have to take a, I mean, middle position between two set of studies. The first set of studies are technologically deterministic studies, which overemphasize the role of technology in the process. Then second set of studies are social constructionist approaches, which overemphasize the role of society in the large process. I mean, I see A.D. Campbell's study on the role of you know, religion and society more from the second set of study. So here I am suggesting a third third category. Here it says, I mean, it is put forth by Nick Coldry, which is broadly used in the context of uh, religion, uh, not in the context of religion, but broadly used to, to find the connections between uh, media and society. So where he says that, it depends upon the situation. In some situations, the role of the technology might be determining. But in the some situations, it may not be true. Or within a specific context, in certain aspects, 
the role of the technology would be very significant, but in the s certain other aspects of that particular issue, the role of the technology may not be determining. In the case of Arab Spring, for example, as far as uniting people are concerned, maybe the role of the technology might be significant, but as far as other aspects of the revolution are concerned, it may not be significant. Uh, that is the core of you know uh, this particular theoretical framework. So I'm, I'm sp uh, specifically in this area, I'm trying to understand uh, the med role of mediations in the network publics uh, to understand how it is resulting in the formations of the uh, religious identity. So I'm using a combination of uh, multi-sided ethnography and ethnography. So the reason why I, why I have not just restricted into the uh, call, I mean content analysis is that just by restricting into the content analysis, you are not going to have a better appreciation of the social reality which you are studying. So, uh, so to have better appreciation of the social reality or to have robust knowledge, I mean, I would suggest you know scholars have to in integrate both online and offline methodol met I mean methodology. Uh, one more point, you know, in this regard is that you know very recently, I mean, which motivated me to integrate both methods. But it is, I mean, as far as economic terms, it is quite costly. It is not convenient. It is not armchair research. So one point which motivated me to take this research was one of my friend in US is also an academician. He said to me in India there is a lot of communal rift between people. I asked him what what is the reason why you are saying? He said to me that you know when I go to YouTube and I see the comments, people are exchanging a lot of hatred and filth between different communities. So it suggests there is a lot of hatred in the mind of people. I said to him the reality is that. Uh, these people are not representing the old community out there. And they are not representing the old reality out there. So the problem is that you know, we cannot make seeping generalization without finding the connections between what is happily actioning in the field. Yeah, I will quickly run. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, I will just, you know, uh, conclude in a few minutes, uh, two or three minutes I will take. So I will conclude with uh, my major observations. So one is that, you know, uh, what is happening is that there are a lot of discussion groups which are emerging in Malayalam. In this language, like, you know, uh, I mean, there is one discussion group which has two lakh members, more than two lakh members, and where people, with it, people come to discuss variety of things. So, but the thing is, that, the interesting thing is that in, in all these big groups, people of the, I mean, to get attention of what you posted, what happens is that people of same ideology, people of same orientation in, is liking what is posted by a person with quite similar ideology. When, when someone makes a post which is in contradiction with what you, what you don't believe or what you believe, so people don't accept that. And you know, what, as a result of that, what happens, people could able to identify uh, those who conforms their ideology in these platforms. And as a result of that, uh, I mean, often in this platform, even in the Facebook friend list of a person, uh, I mean, a person could able to find 300, 400 people who are quite in lines with uh, their ideology. As a result of that, this person is content which is conforming their ideology. Then another trend is there are WhatsApp groups. WhatsApp groups are like, you know, smaller, smaller discussion groups where there would be like, you know, a very smaller number of people. The maximum limit is 260. So there are also people with quite similar uh, orientation is cons uh, are coming. Then third thing is that there is an increased reach of religion. Previously, as far as, you know, informing the, uh, getting information on religion is concerned, a person may be getting exposed to, to uh, very less content on religion, m maybe through newspaper and all. So with the coming of these platforms, uh, there is an extended platform uh, to get attention on religion and you know convey the messages on religion. So uh, another reason why uh, it is more of like people are coming, people are, it, I mean it is, uh, people are finding people quite similar of their orientation is that uh, in, as far as WhatsApp discussion groups are concerned, the common thread I have observed in what, WhatsApp groups is that uh, there is a WhatsApp group of the family one belongs. So in that group, you know, the, I mean, the people of, you know, the same family comes together. 
uh, then there is a whatsapp group for mahallu mahallu means it is quite like you know the i mean for what christianity it means diocese the people of you know same mahal so th there is also a whatsapp group for that uh, then uh, there are whatsapp groups for the different religious organization where one is part of so in all these things as a result of all of these things what happens uh, people gets you know gets identified with uh, their same religious orientation and it again gets reinforced but even though there is there is yeah uh, yeah yeah uh, so i mean the offline impact of all this process is that there are in some uh, areas people comes together on consensus yeah i will sorry yeah i will finish the it, it is my turn this part so i will just uh, conclude with uh, showing you some pictures so these are the examples of whatsapp groups in different discussion groups uh, they i mean advertise that you know we we will come together in this whatsapp group if you are interested just post your number this is one way people of same interest can come together so then another thing is that religious leaders are nowadays getting more attention in mainstream media with the coming of social media platforms so this is uh, this is the, what one religious scholar speaks on demonetization an issue which happened very recently so you can see the the facebook page of one religious scholar this person you can see quite neat uh, this person has more than uh, 2 and 2 2 lakh 20 uh, 2 lakh 53000 likes in his f facebook so it is in a way that you know uh, it is a new reach which is unprecedented in its nature Uh, this is quite i mean an unprecedented form of a uh, facebook live uh, this is created using the a software known as pal talk uh, then this is one discussion group uh, where you can see there are 30000 members in this group this is just to discuss one topic in religion so this topic this religious discussion group is just to discuss the idea of i mean uh, the bill i mean the monotheism in islam Thank you. Thank you. You have to sit there. Questions, comments, please. Yeah. I'm talking of conclusion, yeah. not observations. No, no, okay. I mean, this, this were more of like you know. What is one more? Yeah. Oh, uh, this is one of the major point which I am making in the study. Uh, expresses variety levels of agreements uh, and disagreements based on the issue and expression is largely influenced by the sense of broader muslim identity for which i use the term ghetto and or a denomination within islam this is what one of the major point central point this is point. observation no this uh, i mean as far as anthropological i mean what i'm using is that uh, this this is this core argument comes from my observations of online platforms mm. so, so what do i conclude from this yeah th this is the, you can that, consider that the muslim identity in a broader sense yeah as a result of digital communication is increasing yeah and at the are a, a re defined simultaneously two processes are happening in the one time what is happening is that uh, i mean the, the sense of broader sense of community is increasing that is happening in the one level in the But second level but you are level, talking only of malayali yeah, in the, i'm specifically talking about right. the malayali diaspora community yeah. so in the second level what is happening is that uh, people are getting more aware about the distinctions between different uh, different you know denominations within islam so i think that thing is quite 
Clearly. Yeah, that was yeah. a very interesting observation. Yeah, what, yeah. What, what you have, uh, um, this is almost like a closed-ended research. You had a very yeah. clear hypothesis that you're looking at the diasporic Malayali yeah. and how being displaced, being vulnerable. And these are working class yeah. people. You didn't mention class at all, but I think that's also a factor. It also comes. And, so, comes and so the online activity is reinforcing and yeah. further deepening yeah. their affili existing affiliation. Excellent. There is a validation that's coming from these groups. Yeah. And, but another one point that I um, uh, perhaps is worthy of consideration is the longevity of such groups, because internet by itself is a very uh, uh, vol fleeting and and volatile thing, and groups can come and form and evaporate in no time. So. Uh, yeah. That's uh, something also worth considering. This is, ma'am, I mean, I can give you a specific example, if time permits. Uh, th there are some groups, you know, I mean, uh, which accelerate in time. But, you know, there are some groups which could able to, you know, survive for six years. So one discussion group you can see, is, its name is Right Thinkers. So this group has nearly two lakh members. And this group is there for the last six years. So this is an exceptional example. I'm wondering whether you could kind of uh, factor in, uh, say, religion and, uh, uh, say, social identity differently. Mm -hmm. see, I think there is some kind of a conflation of these two identities. Yeah, yeah. When you study a particular community in a diasporic community, I mean, a context, yeah. the social identity could have a salience over religion. So, better not to kind of conflate both, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can differentiate. Thank you. Yeah, social identity and religious identity. So, I mean, in the context of religion as well, you can see the impact of this technology over the religious self-identity as well as the social identity, I mean, in the context of the sense of Muslim, the consciousness of Muslim in large. So, this too, yeah. Flexible, fleeting, and going. Identity, of course, certainly, yes. Mm -hmm. Identity is uh, some kind of, a, say, at certain point. Mm -hmm. You speak about religious identity, it is a moment of some kind of a stagnation, but I think as experience, mm -hmm. which takes them beyond. So, if, if it is possible to study yeah. the role of religion in a diasporic mm -hmm. context, yeah. I think that will really shed much, much light. Yeah, Thank you. Good. That is a very interesting insight. That's right. So, I mean, in one, my literature part, you know, one discussion I am bringing is, uh, there is this discussion around whether identity is something fixed or, or fluid. is it fluid thing. Okay. So, actually, I am bringing yeah. that That's discussion right. in my Good. paper. Good, Good. Yeah. Thank That's you. great. Thank you. That's Last great. point, um, Anthony, please, and then we'll go to the next presenter. I just want to address the, the issue of conflation of uh, uh, social and uh, religious identity. I don't necessarily think that it's a conflation, but it's actually a reinforcement of identity because when people are in a particular religious group, of course they also act re um, socially, but but because of by virtue of their religious affiliation, their social manifestations are also somewhat different from people who come from other uh, religious groups or non-religion. And so... So their social actions then sort of reinforce their religious identity, and then their religious identity somehow affects the way they interact with each other or who they choose to interact with each other. So these two sort of um, uh, you know, reinforce one another. And, and you know, I work with the Vietnamese migrants in Thailand, and of course there are many Catholics in Thailand, but there are also many non-Catholic Vietnamese migrant workers, but the Catholic Vietnamese migrant workers tend to associate with one another, and they socially interact with one another, not only in their living spaces, but also at church and other places that they meet. So that affects what happens to them, especially in times of crisis. You know, if you have somebody who's in an accident, then the Catholics reach out to one another and help each other, and and this way, they 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 interact with one another on a social basis, but that stems from their religious identity and, f and, and affiliation. So, so I think, I think um, it's, it's a very interesting study, and I find uh, this report, actually, I find a lot of parallels with what happens in the Vietnamese migrants in diaspora in Thailand as well. So, I mean, 
uh, this I mean what is said about the, uh, the when crisis times how people respond so one interesting trend which happened very recently was uh, I mean there are offline implications as well uh, there were two Salafist groups uh, they were considered as two different denominations within Salafism so since after Narendra Modi came into power and lot of messages about you the concerns of broader Muslim community came together and after 18 years these two dif different I mean, sects within Salafism came together because of their sense of you know we have a common enemy so the same argument is used to for the bringing together of different Muslim sects so I think that would be one point in line with what you say yeah. warrant a lot more uh, and he is presenting on multi-religious expressions of non-Christian foreign students in a Christian school, the digital dimension. And he represents the Del La Salle Health Sciences Institute in the Philippines. Just in terms of time, we're at about 10 past 1. Uh, we aim to finish by 1.30 and have lunch by 2 that we can be out. Good morning. Uh, my apology because unlike the other presenters um, who presented it in a very scientific way, mine is more of an experiential or a case study uh, based on what uh, it's a phenomenal. I used a phenomenological approach and observation as far as my research is concerned. Okay, so I'll try, I may be summing up some of my points. Okay, so religious expressions are essential part of human communications. They reflect our specific belief orientations as well as our convictions. Religious experiences also indicate and reveal our self-expression and cultural inclinations. They are primarily shown in our ways of life and self-expression. But the process of self-expression is a compromise when one is uprooted from his cultural milieu or being surrounded by a majority of crowds whose cultural expressions is exactly opposite from one has been acquainted with. Self-expression is manifested in many ways, of pers uh, ranging from our personal and social lives, but it is particularly reflected in our religious expression as an individual. It is because the religious expression somehow serve as a guiding principle on how and one will conduct their lives. In fact, the study of Sharma and Guest attests that the students affirm their religious belief and practices as a means of coping up with the novelty and abnormality of academic life. The father claimed that students draw on their existing religious resource, that is, formalized belief, ritual practices, knowledge of sacred texts, uh, denominationally specific language, and more subtle behavior as their identities uh, change and adapt to a new context. These realities are particularly noticed in the lives of the international students of the La Salle Health Science Institute in Cavite, Philippines, who are active participants in this simple intellectual endeavor. Well, in unraveling their uh, self-expression, it will be inevitable to notice their multi-religious expressions, having been uh, from different continents and geographical location. Yet despite their, uh, these multi-religious and cultural diversities, they do manifest some similarities in areas pertaining to the utilitation, utilization of technology and its influences to their academic lives. Well, basically the method I used is um, um, a random questionnaire in the interviews and some uh, 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 group interview, but I cluster them according to their geographical uh, origins. So, um, more than that, I think I, I make use of the phenomenological approach as as an, uh, as a method for this inquiry. Now, in the last three years, uh, the De La Salle Health Science Institute has been actively marketing. Uh, there are medical courses, not only in the ne neighboring uh, provinces, but also in, in some other schools in and outside the country. In fact, the College of Medicine has been known for this. And uh, they would ask their students, primarily those uh, foreign students, to pursue uh, medical courses and, uh, uh, to that extent. Now, these young students are exposed to the rigid academ academic life and the need to cope up with the various required curricular and extracurricular activities. Now, academic life cannot essentially be separated from other human realities that envelop them as foreign students, uh, one of which is the religious expressions, which form as part and parcel of their identity as individual. 
religious experience reflects the distinctive culture and philosophy which an individual embraces and practices. Religious expressions are an integral part of human communications and constitute as an inalienable right of the individual regardless if one is educated or not. It forms as a spiritual mantle which hovers an individual in dealing with others. This aspect will be the focal point of my study. Now, okay, as what uh, stipulated earlier, my main participants are the international students of the De La Salle Health Science Institute. Um, it is the only medical um, school owned by the Brothers of Christian School, or known as the De La Salle Brothers. Uh, to date, we have 100 uh, international students uh, coming from 14 uh, countries like China, Fiji, India, Indonesia, Ghana, Japan, Kenya, Korea, Malaysia, and Niger Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, United States, and Zimbabwe. They are currently enrolled in nine different medical colleges of HSI. Um, well, as far as per percentage is concerned, a male constitute about 55%, while the female is constitute the remaining 45%. The majority of these are non-Christians, and a few have no religious affiliations, particularly the Koreans, who are self-confessed atheists. Now, uh, these research participants are digital natives whose uh, way of living is marked and dictated by the use and influence of social media as a digital form of communication. In fact, social media are the digital uh, platforms which, use, which is used for engagement and content delivery and enable the research participants to communicate and interact with each other in real time. Now, almost every aspect of academic life are determined and influenced by technology from the setup in the library, which is e-learning capable, because our institute is, is equipped with these online resources, and they do uh, uh, employ this kind of what we call as uh, outcome-based education approach, where as much as possible, uh, the student is, 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 um, uh, is thought to come up with a final output for every particular subject. And the students to be technologically literate and capable because final output is essential requirement for every subject, as what I have said earlier. Besides, final output cannot be done efficiently without the aid of, human, of uh, information and communication te technology. So this feature reflects the digital orientation of the students that we have in the institute. Now, like, let's go to the religious expressions in DLSHSI. Uh, religious expressions may refer to the ways and means of communicating our belief, convictions, and orientations to some spiritual or higher being. It may be in a form of uh, worship songs, ritual celebrations, or any external actions uh, of honoring or worshiping a superior being whom we adore or believe. It is worthwhile to know that our religious expressions it is worthwhile to know what shapes our religious expressions and how we express them. In the study of the variations in religious expressions across interfaith advocacy and social movement setting, the researcher claimed that the presence of religious gatekeeping institution and the belief among participants in the need to maintain certain boundaries around their faith both shape and constrain the shared practices. Well, uh, there may be no gate. Uh, keeping mechanism in our institute, but every student is encouraged to express the religious conviction. Oh, uh, um, expression of a religion may differ, of course, according to the social context, uh, context, which somehow dictates the manner in which an individual demonstrates his or her religious conviction. Now, most of our international students claim that in our school there is such a thing as open culture, which somehow allows them to express their religious convictions without reservation. Unlike, uh, unlike the other Catholic institutions which mandate strict compliance on their religious faith and practice, the LSHSI promotes religious tolerance with utmost respect for the student's religious convic conviction. Uh, it should be noted that in the, in, in the Philippines, particularly among the Catholic institution, it is quote unquote mandatory that uh, you should comply with the rituals and the uh, the uh, religious practices in the in the institute. In our case, they do come up with a waiver that they will follow and honor, but they are not forced. So, in other words, there is no way of 
proselyte exam in our in our institute. Non-Christian students who are required to take religious education subjects and are advised to consider the subject as part of their academic requirements. Professors are always mindful not to proselytize their students, but rather invite the students to appreciate and discern the, meaningf the meaningfulness of their belief as reflected in their daily lives. Perhaps this is the meaning of the Lasallian expression, live Jesus in our hearts. And if you call your God or Almighty Being a different name, you may substitute the name Jesus in that Lasallian expression as what a Muslim student did when he claimed, live Allah in our hearts. Now, the open culture observation of the participants in this research is in fact a result of the social and value transformation which has been promoted by the president uh, of the school uh, ever since he was appointed. Uh, in his 14-point agenda, um, it culminates in his uh, vision to transform the institute as a place where the experience of God is lived and shared. This is most probably the reason why uh, most of our international students, particularly who are those non-Christians, uh, find our institute as, as easier to, to express their religious conviction. Now, there are some barriers to religious expre expressions. One of which, of course, is the culture, the predominant culture in the institute. Well, uh, most of our international students uh, would claim that it won't be possible to simply express your religious inclination expressions for fear of being ostracized or misunderstood. I remember an African student uh, who recalled his, her experience to be shocked uh, when he said that he's, she's the only um, mm, uh, uh, foreigner in that class. So he kind of found it uh, difficult to express her own conviction. Now, some Korean uh, students who had been uh, in our country for more than, a, more than two years have a relatively easier way of coping up to the culture of the institute and would rather demonstrate the religious expressions. Now, the respondents in, uh, in this study indicates that uh, um, um, a specific uh, barrier for uh, religious expression is the um, on on top of the on this uh, on top of the culture is the 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 rigid uh, academic uh, requirements in our institute. It is because our academic culture of excellence is very much enforced among our students and educators. In fact, it is a common joke uh, a common joke among educators to reply to the various complaints of the students in matters pertaining to their academic life with the expression, welcome to HSI. HSI, the LS HSI, welcome to our institute. The, the more you find it difficult to, to cope with it, uh, it means that you are uh, trying to absorb already the, the, the excellence, or the, the culture of, for excellence. Now, we go now to the technology and religious expression. Now, modern technology, particularly, particularly social media, play an important role in resolving the issues of religious expression. Very often, social media is the last resort in order to fulfill uh, their religious conviction and expressions. This has been um, stipulated very much by, uh, by our international students. A good percentage of our respondents revealed that modern technology is the only alternative way to express their religious convictions. Their orientations and nature as digital natives somehow allow them to cope up with a stressful academic life and the different cultural milieu. Very often, the students would resort to social media to get connected with their friends and relatives and confide their issues, including religious matters. Online religion is a common practice for those who cannot fulfill, fully express their religious convictions because of the academic requirements and difficulties. I would cite, for example, uh, this, some Methodist students who cannot partake to the Saturday service because of their classes in HSI. They would say that they, conf uh, they confide to me that they fulfilled their Saturday obligations by watching uh, via YouTube the sermon and the other religious, uh, religious services they failed to attend. Hindus, by the way, uh, we have around 40 or 50, yeah, less than 50 stud Hindu students a sort of exchange students. Hindu students would resort to the same technique in order to express the religious orientations and convictions. Social media and mobile apps are helpful for the religious expressions, particularly the WhatsApp. Hmm. There are some students, uh, there are some 
students, however, who do not rely on social media in order to express their religious conviction. I would uh, stipulate here the Koreans who would treat social media with suspicion and reservations in matters pertaining to religious conviction. Some of them um, would say that social media is a venue where one do not necessarily reveal the real selves nor the, religious, the real religious conviction. One can pretend and hide their authentic religious conviction and orientations because one can be anonymous in social media. This is students' further claim that social media do not elicit the emotion and the inner sensitivity which we experience in a face-to-face -face communication. Perhaps this is the meaning of what Father Eilis would saying, uh, would telling us about the concept of the revenge of analog. Would uh, would so would uh, some where we say that um, p uh, the digital natives would still resort to the analog because they would say that analog is more uh, expressive in that matter. The generation of these uh, dig digital natives are marked not only by their proficiency in communication technologies, but also by their way of manipulating it. The same generation has grown past from Web 2.0, and now that we have already at 2.3, and what uh, Ajarn have said that we are already in, we are already approaching to Web 4.0. Okay. Now, um, a, a, uh, may I just quote um, or stipulate the, the work of Brasso, which says that uh, digital consumption and the digital self, uh, in his work, on digital consumption and the digital self, he claims that digital technologies allow us to be actively present even when our bodies are not. Online media, for example, has the ability to represent our concept of self as a presence and co-presence. Presence, which is also known as telepresence, refers to the illusion of being there in the virtual world or online game. Co-presence, on the other hand, refers to the perception of being in the shared virtual setting with remote others. Accordingly, the presence or telepresence is progressively embodied in the avatar that we use. Thus, avatar is not only the three-dimensional graphic character that we manipulate in the computer screen, but also refers to our online representation of ourselves, like our blogs, social media profiles, the selfie photos that we have, and the other online traces. The result of this interview, uh, I mean, my, my, um, uh, and also my, my penological um, approach with them, it reveals that there's only one reality that they are dealing with, the, uh, with a generation of students whose lives is marked with digitalization. From, in fact, uh, we all know that uh, they had been uh, influenced by this, from rising to going to bed. So they make use of the digital technology uh, for, for their consumption. Our phenomenological experience as educator attests to this reality. In fact, um, in fact, we used to call them as iPad or iPad generation because they are known for their iPad gadgets manipulation and the FAD that they attribute to it. The same generation of students can transform the whole range of concepts and learnings discussed in the school through a mobile gadgets. You will be amazed how one can produce a video presentation using only their iPads or their iPhones to come up with a very professional presentation. Uh, I notice it a lot. Now, the whole range of academic and social lives of research, I am about to finish. The whole range of academic and social life of research participants are indeed marked with digitalization. It is not uh, surprising to know that even the religious expressions as the students are governed by it. It is precisely on this account that Monsignor Tai claimed that we need to recognize the significance of the digital arena where most of the young people are communicating. Understanding their language will allow us, sorry, Understanding their language will allow us to understand the religious expression and convictions. Perhaps looking at the language and religious conviction of these non-Christian students in a Christian school like the La Salle Health Science Institute, one will be driven to examine the avatars that we are involved and preoccupied with. And with that, I thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Comments and questions, please? I actually like this idea of the avatars. Yeah. Mm, 
It's a very fascinating thing, and I think we can push this uh, argument. Um, even, uh, you know, the kind of work that uh, Unni Krishnan is doing, that the, yeah. the idea of looking at uh, uh, visual yeah. in, for, in, in the sense of avatar, something that uh, would be very interesting. I mean, the, if you look back at the, um, the origins of that term, um, in Hindu philosophy, the the idea of uh, the dasha avatar, the avatars, which is the same God in ten different forms, it's true, it's true, it's true. and this is not reincarnation. It is the same uh, God in ten different forms. It's the ten different forms of Vishnu, but is not. Uh, they are different at the same time, the same. Um, and you have similar things with pretty much all the gods and goddesses of you know you have 10000 forms of uh, shiva 10000 forms of vishnu 10000 forms and they are all the same as well as different okay um, and i think that uh, to take that uh, analogy and and uh, go to the digital world makes a lot of sense um, because right now we actually have many avatars of the same people in Facebook, yes. in um, in social media at, at, at large. And it, and I, I think this would, you know, I haven't thought uh, it through, but I think this is a very, very interesting idea. Yeah, and perhaps we can even say that our religious conviction and our uh, religious uh, expression can be a form of avatar. <laughs> yeah, but then you can but, redesign your the entire narrative of yourself, your identity, your life. Yes, yes, and and, and in fact, if you look at the uh, the avatars, uh, let's say the dasha avatara, uh, the one avatara uh, does not overtake the other. The other. Yeah, they are distinct. Okay. And and uh, none of the ten avatars. Um, are bigger or smaller than the Vishnu, whose avatars these ten are. You see, so the Vishnu is the the uh, the source, the source god, the source god. Yeah. and then there are these ten thousand, ten thousand or ten or whatever avatars. But each of them has an identity of their own, mm -hmm. and none of them are bigger than the source. Or smaller than the source. That's an interesting thing. They're a co presence, as you said. Yes, it is. But any last comment? <laughs> I do want to give this to the opportunity to respond if the, yes. Thank you, Julian. You're really up on all the yes. cutting-edge research. We've learned a lot from you. Thank you. Yes.